Don't miss our tips and tactics video on the brand new Blades of Corn Battle Tomb. Spiky bits. What's up, Hobby Maniacs? Rob Bear with you again today, taking a look at all the dirty tips and tactics in the new Battle Tomb for Corn. So, I finished reading this up, and I'll be honest with you, just a standard caveat for these tips and tactics videos, anything to do with 40k or even the new Age of Sigmar seems to be almost a college class in and of itself. So there are going to be things that we miss. There's going to be things that you know from reading this that we may misspeak about or that you could put in the comments to add to the discussion. Because to be honest, I spent a whole afternoon reading this, comparing it to not only the old Corn Bloodbound book, but also the units in the Grand Alliance Chaos book and the General's Handbook for points value. So we covered a lot of ground in a short amount of time and you know, it's release weekend, so there's gonna be things that fall through the cracks. Had Games Workshop getting me, gotten me these materials ahead of time like they like to do for some other people, well, that'd be a different story, but you know, we're on a schedule around here. <laughs> we like to get these videos out, but unfortunately, there's gonna be something new next week that we gotta cover. So that's kind of live by the sword, die by the sword when it comes to that, but we do, our very best to give you uh, the crispest, most concise summary of the overall changes for this. Now, obviously, they've combined the old Bloodbound book with new rules that have come out since then, along with General's Handbook Izine, as far as you know, the command abilities and things like that. The corn rules themselves so overall this is a 152 page book it's got 30 all 33 of the war scrolls that are current uh 23 new battalions in here they are divided up between demons and mortal you can't intermix them but you can take uh battalions from either or but you can't take a battalion that contains all of them together kind of type deal so just keep that in mind there is some dirtiness to be had trust me i think overall this is um in nearly every war scroll that i compared to the previous bloodbound book is a cut and paste port over from their previous incarnation with a couple of uh grammatical changes it looks like uh, this uh, blood creator is the same uh, most of the stuff in here is the same, all the bloodthirsters and such. Now, there is some points difference, and there was only two that I could find at Cursory Look. Again, remember, we're, we're covering a lot of ground, so we are bound to miss a thing or two. That the Blood Reavers are now 10 points more, and the Cougarots are 100. I think they're up from 80. So there is a couple of points changes, and the points are in the back of the book right here. So, and But there is so many new rules. It's almost like they didn't have to change their rules because they're giving them so many new rules and abilities that, that almost kind of makes sense. And it's pretty smart on Games Workshop's part because they can take what's existing, they can add blanket abilities and then put out a second edition book of it because this book isn't even barely a year old to be quite honest. Like it might be just a little over a year old because all of the rules were first contained in the Realms of Chaos a book that came out, right? So that's kind of cool. On the negative side, it's a little discouraging because some of us that bought that Bloodbound book, it's basically irrelevant now. All the battalions have been reworded and replaced. Um, sure, the War Scrolls in there are the same, but now why would you want that when all of the special abilities are in here? So it's a little kick in the nuts as far as that goes, and they did the same thing as Sigmar, but they combined multiple books. So I'm kind of like, yay, we get new rules, and Corn is a little bit more relevant. I, I feel like they were, they were relevant secretly. They did very well at LVO. Um, but I feel like they were relevant secretly, but now they are, boom, hey, we're relevant. You can't ignore us now. So that's cool. But then on the back side, we're kind of paying for stuff that we just paid for like a year ago. But that's Games Workshop, so I don't know. You know, it kind of didn't go with your heart there and put it with your hobby dollars, right? I obviously bought the book because, well, that's A, it's my job, but B, I also like to have all the books and keep up with all the rules and things so I can help people answer questions. Now, new is the Blades of Corn uh, War Scroll cards, which I feel were, eh, I feel like they need a little work. Sorry, GW, but these are just, they're a little too cumbersome for my taste, but that, is, again, is my taste. It may help some other folks out there. So let's actually stop talking and get into the actual new rules themselves. Now, if I talked about every new rule and every new ability and every new little nuance that came in this book, uh, we would be here for an hour, and I don't think anybody wants that, to be quite honest, except for maybe YouTube, because, you know, they like ads. <laughs> but ask PewDiePie about that. He's got, he's got lots to say about YouTube ads, let me tell you. So first off, 
Lots of new material in here, like we were saying. Now we got new blood tithe rules. Now we got new demonic gifts. We got blood blessings, uh, which are basically an expand expandment on the priest abilities from existing war scrolls. So now, not only do they get that, but they also have the ability to do some other stuff, which is really cool too. Uh, battle plans are in here, and 33 roll scroll or war scrolls, 23 battalions, and pitch battle profiles, which we already showed you in the back of the book. Now let's skip ahead to the stuff that matters. We've already first looked at this book on the channel, so check that out if you want to see everything else in here. We're basically just going to talk about rules, and we're not going to talk about all the all the rules. We're going to talk about the rules that I think you need to be the most aware of, aka the dirty tips and tricks. I'm not going to tell you how to build an army and like crush people or anything like that. That's that's not our purview here. Obviously, when we're hobby centric but I will show you some stuff that you need to be aware of if you are playing these guys or you are setting up across the table for them now fortunately we have the new Azir app so if you see somebody playing something you can just ask them what it is you can literally pull it up on your phone you don't even have to bother them for their book or anything like that heck you don't even need to bring your book in some instances which is really neat to see so I think games workshop's got something going on right there so forces of corn uh, they basically explain, hey, how all this allegiance works. It doesn't matter if you're mortal, if you're demon, or if you're bloodbound. If you say corn, you can use these rules in this book. If you're all corn, so that's a little bit less specific than normal, which I kind of, I kind of dig, and I like to see. Battle traits, the big one, of course, is their blood tithe. And Blood Tithe works a little different in Age of Sigmar than it does in 40k. You can use it with Blood Tithe in either hero phase, either hero phase, but you can only use it once per phase. So you get Blood Tithe points for anything that dies in either armies, the end period. That's pretty crazy. Once you spend your Blood Tithe points, which you can do in either of the hero phases per person, the rest of the remaining points are discarded. Okay, so that's kind of some differences between 40k and Age of Sigmar here. Now, the, the sweet spot is right here, I feel like. Now, you can get demons uh, if you get to 8, but you have to have reserve points for them if you're playing match play, so that's kind of irrelevant, I feel like. But I feel like where you want to be is this 4, 5, and 6 right here, so let's take a look at that. Crimson Raid, on a D3, all corn models in the battlefield immediately heal that many wounds, which can be hugely beneficial depending on what you're rolling on, especially if you're taking crushers. Uh, Frenzy is uh, select a corn unit from your army. That unit can immediately pile in and attack as if it were the combat phase. So that could kind of turn the tides of battle right there if you need something to happen like immediately. But the one I really like is six, Brass Skull Meteor, which is pick a single unit anywhere on the battlefield. That unit immediately suffers D3 mortal wounds. In addition, roll a dice for each unit within eight of the unit you just picked. On a roll of four or more, that unit being rolled for suffers a mortal wound. So it kind of like, poof, Kind of envelops out so if you get a big chunk of stuff going on in the middle which you're apt to do because corn brah, comes to the middle and or comes across the table and a lot of instances we're going to see in here and it just jumps you then you're like boom and then you're you're just triggering off mortal wounds everywhere which will drop little stuff and, and maybe finish off little units give you those blood points back and start start stacking them up so i i feel like that's kind of where you want to be um, there's lots more here. So, we're, like I said, we're just covering ground. We're not going to talk about every little thing. Command traits are pretty neat. Uh, again, you can, they work just like normal command traits, but you are restricted depending on what you are if you're bloodbound, demon, or mortal. The first three, or the first three are all the same, like we saw in the Zinch book, which kind of m makes sense, I suppose. Uh, they're all pretty decent, to be quite honest. Uh, the first one, you get an additional blood point anytime your hero slaves, or your general here slays a hero or monster, which is kind of their point, I would imagine. Uh, the second one, if you're within 12 inches of any unit, at the end of your opponent's charge phase, you can immediately attempt to charge move with your general, so if you need to get shit done, boom, right there situational at best of course and remember you can pick these so it's not like you're stuck with a useless one three is kind of cool i like this one you can reroll any of your generals failed to hit and wound rolls when making attacks in the combat phase so if you're a blender you might want to pick that one but the ones i really personally like and i think you need to be aware of is <laughs> where are my notes here is uh on demonic number six which is right here. Devastating blow, any wound rolls for six by attacks made with your general in combat. Inflict the number of mortal wounds equal to the weapon's damage characteristic instead of being resolved normally. That can be pretty dirty. 
that I can get a lot of stuff done all at once. And remember, that's only for demons, so keep that one in mind right there. And then on the Mortal Six, another one that's pretty good. You can reroll failed charge rolls for any of your general, any corn units from your army. There are within eight of him at the start of the charge phase. This is one that you really want to keep an eye on right here because this is going to compound with a lot of things that come later. So remember that one right there. When it comes to artifacts of power, there's uh, different types, but they all count as artifacts of power. Even the gifts count as artifacts of power. So you can only take one, but you can take additionals for every battalion in your army, which I think you're going to probably want to take battalions. So all of this counts as, demon as artifacts of power, even though they're listed as demonic gifts, etc., etc. And then these are additionally bound. You can only be a demon to take some stuff like that. You also have banners and you also have trophies. And the banners are restricted to totem guys, like your blood secretor, right? The, to the trophies are uh, just basically stuff, little trinkets, you know, whatever that, that hangs on something. You can't assign that as a weapon to one of the mounts, but everything else goes pretty much right there. Murder's artifacts are just for a mortal hero right there. And I think the the winner out of these right here, at least in my opinion, is the Gore Cleaver, which I pretty much like. Pick one of the hero's melee weapons to be the Gore Cleaver. Attacks from the Gore Cleaver uh, inflict an additional Neg 1 rend. In addition, any wound rolls of six inflict the number of mortal wounds equal to the weapon's damage characteristic instead of being resolved normal. Apparently, there's a cat. Hello, cat. What are you doing? You want to come up and hang out? Okay. So that's that's the cat of corn. She's just hanging out. <laughs> Never seen her do that before in the history of ever. But all right, we're breaking new ground today. It's corn. So that one's pretty cool. Definitely be aware of that bad boy right there. As far as the banners go, I was... um. I'm pretty impressed with them. I like them all. And I think the thing you need to be aware of right here is they do not replace any existing abilities. So your Brud Secretor with his little portal to the nether regions that gives everybody within a certain range, I believe it's 12, plus one attack. Now, also in addition to that, can do these abilities here. And the first one is reroll one, uh, rolls of one in a combat phase for any core models from your unit within eight. So it tightens the bubble a little, little bit, but it's still pretty respectful. Don't you come back over here and jump on my book. Uh-uh. No, sir. No, sir. You are done here. You are done. You get you get nothing. All right. Trying to, trying to maintain a professional work environment around here. I got castle jumping on my books and stuff. So that's pretty cool, right? So it tightens the bubble, but it gives you additional abilities, which I feel like are pretty good. Banner of Wrath in each of your hero phases roll a dice for each enemy unit within eight of the barrel on a four or more that unit being rolled for suffers a D3 mortal wound. So I like this because it's 50-50. It's not one of those roll for every unit and then on a six it does something. Those suck. I don't like those. They never work. And I always forget them. And when I do remember them, I roll it and I don't get a six, so I'm upset. And just a little piece of me dies each and every time I try one of those abilities. But this one's on a four. Now, however, your blood security always plants the staff, so he's stuck in one spot. So this might not be a good match for him, but if you're not taking that, well, there you go. That might work for you. Banner of Blood is pretty good because you can read all, all failed charge rolls for any corn units from your army that are within eight of the bear at the start of the charge phase, which kind of combos with this violent urgency as well. However, if you're taking, depending on how many blood securities you're taking, um, well, you could take that and you could take that and just kind of blanket the ability, the battlefield with the ability to reroll your charge distances depending on where you position things. Just food for thought. Trophies of War, those are the little trinkets and everything we were talking about there. I think two is pretty good. When you make save rolls with the bear, ignore the enemy's rend characteristics unless it's neg two or better. That's always the winner in my book. And Talisman of Burning Blood, add one to any roll, run, add one to any run rolls you make for the bear and any corn units in your army that are within eight inches of them at the start of movement phase. In addition, Add one to any charge rolls you make for the banner and any corn units from your army that are within eight inches at the start of the charge phase. So not only do you get an extra one inch to your run, but an additional one inch to your charge, which you also get to reroll charges in a lot of instances. So we're starting to blanket, starting to see how this army is going to work. It's best, in my opinion, played as a horde army with blanketing abilities, which is something I personally excel at. I love, I love that style of play. So there you go. Kind of got some ideas kicking around in your head, right? Demonic Gifts, uh, also very good stuff right here. Definitely worth talking about. Uh, there's a couple of them. Normal restrictions, like we said, on uh, taking the Artifacts of Power. But other than that, we've got the King of Blades. Hey, you get to hit enemy hero models under two or more. That one's pretty good. If you're trying to be a blender and trying to be taking out uh, big things, well, you might want to consider that one right there. Otherwise, it kind of sucks because, you know, it's not everything out of two up. It's not, it's definitely no Carn of Betrayer, that's for sure. And then Behemoth's Blade right here. Pick one of your he hero's melee weapons to be the Behemoth Blade, Bane, 
and you can reroll any failed wounds and rolls to choose again uh, damage rolls when attacking enemy monsters with this weapon so if you got to go up against enemy monsters and such well that might be worth it but again you're gonna have so many blanket abilities and so many other things that yeah if you want to show build guy these are good but these are probably the best ones that are right here okay it's just something to keep in mind I, I kind of not feeling the demonic gifts, but then again, you generally when you're taking something with a demonic gift, it's going to be a big baddie, so you might as well make him as bad as you can. Uh, demonic adornments, any corn here that's a demon can be given one of the following adornments. It's basically uh, like a trinket, but it's called an adornment, whatever. I like it either way. The, uh, let's see, what are my choices here? Uh, I think that was the blessings of corn. Oh, adornments. Uh, Mark of the Slayer is definitely something you need to be aware of. Holy cow. So Mark of the Slayer, the bearer of this mark, becomes the locus of corn's bloodlust on the battlefield. Remember, this is going to be a demon character or hero. You reroll. You can reroll all hits of one in the combat phase for the bearer and all corn units within eight of them at the start of the combat phase. Now, it's important to remember because remember, you got a guy in the middle, eight inches this way, eight inches this way, if he's on a 60 mil base or even a Dreadnought size base, you've got a big chunk of the battlefield covered in your little effect bubble right there. If the bear charged earlier in the turn, you can also reroll rolls of one in a combat phase for the bear and all corn units with an eight at the start of the combat phase. Basically, you get preferred enemy everything as long as you had charged earlier in the turn. That's bananas. That's really good. Now keep that in mind when we just talked about all those other blanket abilities to give you plus one to your run, plus one to your charge, to be able to charge and reroll. It's just it's, things are starting to stack here. Things are starting to congeal, so to speak, with this blood, all this blood and run around the table and stuff. Then we've got the blood blessings of corn. Now these are really nifty. Uh, I like these. They, uh, you do them during a hero phase. They're very similar to what we saw with the priest uh, on the priest war scrolls in the past. But now there's uh, four different ones or six different ones, which I think are all pretty good except for the, the last one, which is for like anti psyker stuff. But depending on how good psychers get, or excuse me, casters in Age of Sigmar, it might be worth taking a look at. Now, here's the deal you have to pass a four up. Um, if they killed something earlier in the turn, you get plus one of that, so it's three up. So you got basically, what does that go to? A 66% chance or something like that to actually get it off. Uh, if you roll one, which is one sixth of the time, of course, you take D3 wounds. Now your priests have six wounds in this army, so you could uh, fail. You could fail this a couple of times. You might not be super danger in danger zone, but don't fail it a lot of times because that'll be really bad you'll sack your own dudes but at least you get blood tights I suppose right so let's talk about all these except for the last one uh, bronze flesh if the player's uh, prayer is successfully is successful pick a either a priest or corn unit from your army that's within 16 and visible you can add one to the save rolls of the unit you picked until the start of your next hero phase very important it's very very hard to get plus one to your save rolls in a corn army so take note of that one right there um, also each priest knows a blessing. Note that each priest can know a different blessing. If you and if you prefer, you can instead generate one blessing that will be known by all of your corn priests. So all you guys can have the same one, or they can have different ones. So keep that in mind right there as well. Uh, blood sacrifice. If the player is successful, pick either a priest or corn unit from your army that is within three of the priests. That unit immediately suffers D3 wounds, but you gain one blood tithe point. If he's on the edge and he's about to die, you might as well try to cast it. If he dies. You get an extra blood tithe point because he dies, and of course, you would get one from that spell right there. If not, it's great to try to pick off stragglers and get that extra blood point. If you kill something, you get a blood point, and you get another blood point just, just because. So, ways to get blood points 101 right there, blood sacrifice. Three, resanguination. If the player successfully picks on either the priest or a corn hero from your army that is within 16 and visible, the model you picked immediately heals D3 wounds lost earlier in the battle. Okay, could help, could not help, but it's good to have options like that. These are basically like a uh, Swiss Army Knife kind of character, and I'm loving them so far. Brazen Fury. If the player is successful, pick a corn unit from your army that is within 16 of the priest, which is visible. The unit picked does not have to take battle shock tests until the next hero phase. Also, very important like these are all good things to be aware of and to be able to uh, adjust your battlefield tactics using these and five killing frenzy pick either a priest or corn unit from your army that's within 16 and visible add one to the hit rolls of the unit you picked until the until your next hero phase so not only are you in some instances rerolling ones rerolling ones to wound but you're also getting plus one to hit 
very cool. So a lot of things are stacking. A lot of you kind of start starting to make sense now. That all of this stuff happening. Then we got the battle plans, which we're not going to really talk about. And then we kick it over to and the path to glory stuff. Then we kick it over to the war war scroll battalions, and they're divided into two sections. One is demons. One is corn. Okay. But what you really need to know about is that there's a, kind of a catch-all battalion, which is the one in the front of each section, which is right here, Demon Legion of Corn, And they all generally have abilities that will trickle over to the big war uh, battalions in the back that contain the multiple battalions. If you meet a certain restriction, like you max out your units, then you gain these abilities right here, which in this case, it's a corn cares not from where the blood flows. Units are wiped out in combat phase. You can add one to the attack characters to all melee weapons used by the demonic legion of corn for the remainder of that combat phase. So something has to die and you get plus one attack for the rest of the combat. So plan accordingly. Uh, reveal in the revel in the carnage, you're, uh, you mainly gain one blood tithe point at the start of each of your hero phases. No strings attached, it just happens. So that's kind of cool. Um, same thing for the mortal units, which we're going to get to here in a second. There is what we just talked about, and then they have their own special ability right here, which is um, if units from the Bloodbound World uh, oh, can attempt to unbind one spell in each of the enemy phase in the same manner as a wizard, uh, the Mighty Lord of Corn or the Slaughter Peace Priest unbinds it, you can immediately earn a Blood Tithe point. So it kind of helps out there, but it's not, it's not super worth going home about right there. So Demon Legion of Corn, the restrictions right there, we're not going to talk about every one, but what we are going to talk about are these two right here, and more specifically, the Murder Host. The Murder Host, holy cow, I don't even know, I cannot make my mouth work with words for how good I feel like this Murder Host is. It, okay, so first of all, it consists of the following units, a blood letter hero, whatever. Three to eight units chosen for any combination of the following list. Blood letters, flesh hounds, blood crushers, and skull cannons. All really good, trust me. Skull cannons hit on a two up if you're shooting a unit with 10 or more models. I believe they have a neg two modifier. Uh, they do a ton of damage, I think D6. They hit on threes, they wound on threes. Like I said, if it's more than 10 models, they hit on twos. They only get to shoot once. And there is a way to get them to shoot multiple times in in here, but that's not the trick. They are good in a pinch if you have them. But what is really good is the blood letters themselves. Like they they're they're good. They're cheap. They're 10 points for 10. Or they're 80 points for 10, excuse me. So 800 points for eight units of blood letters. But look what, what happens here. After a setup is completed, roll two dice for the for the murder host's blood letter hero, and for each unit from this battalion that is within eight inches. Make that happen, you can do it. <laughs> Move the units being rolled for up to the total distance rolled in inches. If the murder host contains the maximum number of units at the start of battle, you can repeat this process in each of your unit hero phases. Each of your hero phases, you can roll an extra 2d6. Then, guess what? Remember earlier, you can reroll your charge, plus one to one run, plus one to uh, your charge distance. Not only can you reroll your charge, you get plus one if you do it correctly. Now this is just demons, so you gotta take that into account. But this is a very, very powerful blender of death right here, trust me. Especially if you got your blood secretors on station and they're dropping the plus one attacks for these blood letters. They're and every remember every six mortal wounds. Like this is good. Like do not overlook this. You see this on the tabletop, you need to be aware of the situation. <laughs> or you need to be fielding this and getting it into a situation against your enemies. <laughs> Uh, Blood Thunder Stampede I also really like, just because of the fact that Blood Crushers on paper kind of aren't worth it. But in this uh, battalion, they get a little bit of a bump. Uh, of course, they get a bump over here too, which I'm not sure. I'm kind of torn on which way to take them. I feel like the Horde way is good, but you can always slide some into here too. Uh, what's really cool is... Um, for roll dice for each enemy unit within three um, from any units within this battalion in each of your hero phases on a two or more that suffers d3 mortal wounds as they are crushed beneath the juggernauts herds stampeding hoofs so remember I don't like the things that are like hey check on a six you're checking on a two here and it's doing d3 mortal wounds that's pretty significant something to be aware of blood scent um, if any of the <laughs> units in either army have been wiped out the blood Thunder Stampede adds three to their charge rolls, and again, I don't have to tell you about what we talked about earlier with rerolling and plus ones and all that stuff. That's bananas. 
Obliterating charge if a uh, unit uses murder's charge ability within three inches of another unit with in the Blood Thunder Stampede, you do not need to roll the dice. It automatically inflicts D3 mortal wounds. Or D6 if the Blood Crushing unit includes six or more models as the enemy is trampled to the bloody pulp. That is that ability that normally on a four up, when they hit, they kind of do impact hits. Actually, I think it might even be a six. Whatever it is, I always forget it. And by the time I remember to do it, it never works. But this, it works way more often than previously. So. If you're really into Blood Crushers and you have a lot in your collection, such as myself, that's why I'm so excited about it. Not necessarily because it's super competitive, this might be for you. But this one definitely needs to not be overlooked by a lot of folks out there. The rest of them are kind of good. Um, this is the one, the Gore Thunder Cohort. This is the one where you get to shoot twice with your Skull Cannons, which can be pretty fun. Because like I said, we just talked about their stat lines right there. But the rest of them are just kind of ho-hum. I mean, they give you additional Tithe abilities. They might let you reroll wounds or reroll to hits. But I feel like with the abilities that we already talked about, you're already you know, ace up your sleeve with some of these abilities here, like being able to reroll this or get plus one to that or just get them in on the station. And what I'm about to show you, these guys right here just charging in and being able to get across the table even quicker uh, with their crazy, crazy weapons is pretty interesting. Then you got the Reapers of Vengeance and the Blood Lords. This is more, uh, these guys right here are more on the Blood Letter and Blood Crusher side. Uh, what was the difference between them? This was, oh, this is more of like a, the big guys and this is more like the little guys. Uh, they're okay. I mean, they're definitely worth taking and definitely be worth being aware of and you can combo them off with some of the, the other battalions right here. And then, of course, if you have the maximum unit um, organization here, you get those two special rules that we talked about right here. But, I mean, overall, I feel like these are okay and they're very fluffy and all these battalions are very fluffy but competitively on the tabletop you want some punch because there's a lot of stuff out there you need to get your stuff across the table and engage because that's your thing and um this there's lots of ways to do it but uh, we we're going to show you a few uh, good ones here so here's the mortal side the blood bomb war horde we already talked about a lot of these are ported directly over actually the majority of them are ported directly over from the bloodbound book but with a few tweaks here and there points wise i think they were all the same to be quite honest um the ones that i think you need to be aware of is this dark feast right here this is where this can get a little crazy right here so if you like this might actually be why they raised the price of the blood reavers because uh, so you got the Blood Stoker, which you know, of course helps you get across the table. We don't need to tell you about that one. That's been around for two years now. Uh, Slaughter Priest, again, uh, Slaughter Priest can do the uh, brand new Blessings of Corn, which I think is definitely uh, a benefit right there. Three to six units of Blood Reavers. So if your Slaughter Priest from this unit is still alive, you can incite the Dark Feast Terrible Feeding Frenzy. Uh, add plus one attack characteristics to any of the melee weapons being used from a unit with this battalion whenever it is selected to attack. So let's take a look at the Blood Reavers abilities here. So Blood Reavers, they are 10 points more now, like I said. Force to hit, force to wound, one damage right here uh, with one attack, okay? But remember, they have the Frenzy Devotion. As long as they're within range to a Chaos Totem, they get to make two attacks instead of one. Okay, well that's cool. Well, guess what else is a Totem? The Blood Secretor. So if you drop it, you open the portal, you get another attack. So now you're at three attacks. Now if you got this guy, you're at four attacks. These guys are literally one of the cheapest units on the tabletop and able to make four attacks at fours and fours. A squad of 10 of these generating out four to five attacks, you know, that's 40 to 50 attacks, hitting on fours, which is 50%, you're, you're going to wound, you're going to hit 25 times, you're going to wound 12, 13 times on the tabletop. And I mean, let's be honest, a lot of stuff out there has a four up save, has a five up save, you're going to fail whatever you're attacking. You know, it's going to fail on a six, going to fail six wounds or so. That's two whole elite units. Um, that's a big chunk out of something big. Like, these guys are the real deal right here. And the, the ability to have them flooding in and just staying in your backfield, kind of protecting um, your available characters, are is something pretty much you really, I feel like you should not overlook. I feel like this Dark Feast battalion right here is really, really good. Um, just use them to fill in and take up space and, you know, uh, be the shock troops ahead of the blood letters or behind the blood letters because you paired this, this right here paired with what we just talked about with the murder host seems like a solid way to go and then just sprinkle in whatever HQ you want right there. Now there's some other good stuff too that um, was decent, but again, it's just all a lot of little stuff like, hey, get, you know, an extra one to wound, get a reroll on this. 
it's all very fluffy stuff, but it's not super, super ridiculously like, hey, this is competitive. I need to take this to compete with, you know, say, Sigmarines or something like that, or, um, you know, the Elves, uh, whatever, you know. So there's some good stuff in here. Don't get me wrong. And there's some stuff that people are going to be like, why didn't you talk about that? I mean, uh, we have to, we're already at 30 minutes. So we have to pick and choose what we're talking about with this battalion. I'm going to show you what you need to be aware of. And what I feel like is the stuff to give you the tools to pick up this book and make your own army list knowing what the, the dirty tips and tricks, the basics, and then filling it in with the rest of the units there. Now, as far as the war scrolls themselves go, like I said, pretty much everything matched up as best as I could tell. Um, the only other thing was those two uh, little points differences that I saw. Now, I also don't like personally, and this is just this is a little thing about the war scroll, is they kind of cram them in here and there's no pictures of the actual units. Like, not a lot of people are going to know what a you know skull grinder is, you know, what a skull taker is. Like, what model is this? I guess if you look it up on GW site, it's good, but if you have the model in your hand and you're looking at the book, that you know, it might be a little a little hard to do. But that was the only kind of criticism I had for the way they're doing their uh, their new war scroll uh, kind of layout here with just kind of cramming them in with no pictures. But other than that, I think it's a solid book that really has up to the power level of these guys here. I mean, you, the, taking these guys in a horde format, just getting across the table, sprinkling in some dope HQs or like a big demon bloodthirster um, is really neat. And there was actually something that gave them, and I forgot to talk about it, there was a new piece of war gear that gave them double, I think it gave them double attacks, but if he didn't, um, if they didn't kill the th uh, something in combat, they were slain themselves. So that was, you know, I mean, be careful who you put that on, but that could be pretty fun too in a corn list, right? And then if you kill yourself, well, hey, you get a, you get a blood type point anyway. So, hey, what, <laughs> what's the diff at that point, right? Corn cares not. So that's it for this one. I hope you really enjoyed our uh, brand new tips and tactics, or AKA the dirty tips and tactics, at least for the, uh, the, 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 the fantasy or the Age of Sigmar books, because we just don't have time and we're already at half an hour. Just can't cover every little thing. We'll just drone on forever. But I feel like we hit the basics here to give you guys a good understanding of the changes to the book the new rules that you need to be aware of and where to kind of start with those crazy combo ideas out there uh, to make these guys worth it on the tabletop against all of the new General's Handbook era uh, war, war or battle tomes out there. So that's it for this one, folks. Thanks for watching. Deleted scenes, bonus content, and all the interviews and post-game wrap-up videos can be located in the Hall of Veterans on thelongwar.net. Visit thelongwar.net today and try a week completely free with no strings attached. That's not all. TheLongWar.net is also your hobby resource for exclusive early access with an ad-free experience to all your favorite videos. Members of the Hall of Veterans gain early exclusive access to multiple hobby videos.